is kind of a seat. Uh, <laughs> and can you hear in the back the uh, all important question? Thanks for coming. This is the the last uh, event of the year uh, for the for the basement series. We'll be starting up sometime at the in mid January. Uh, check lodgebooks.com for more of this sort of thing, and of course, as many poetry poetry readings as you can eat. Um, tonight, uh, we are so honored to welcome Sylvia Federici and Jenny Brown in conversation. Um, we, I want to thank our co-sponsors, the Democratic Socialists of America, and as always, uh, PM Press, one of the great presses, and we are so lucky to have them local, uh, hopefully for as long as they can afford to stay local. Um, please support them. Uh, there will be a signing afterwards. Every book you buy keeps PM Press going, and we need to do that. Uh, Sylvia Federici is a feminist writer, teacher, and militant. In 1972, she was co-founder of the International Feminist Collection that launched the Wages for Housework campaign. Her books include Witches, Witch Hunting, and Women, Caliban and the Witch, Reenchanting the World, and Revolution at Point Zero. She's a professor emerita at social, at social Sciences at Hofstra University in Hampstead, New York. She worked as a teacher in Ni Nigeria for many years and was also co-founder of the Committee for Academic Freedom for America. She will be in conversation with Jenny Brown. Uh, this is her second visit to us. Uh, so happy to have you back. <laughs> Uh, a National Women's Liberation Organizer and former editor of Labor Notes. She was a leader in the grassroots campaign to have morning, the morning after pill contraception available over the counter in the US and was a plaintiff in a winning lawsuit. In addition to Labor Notes, her work has appeared in Jacobin, Huffington Post, and Alternet, and she is co-author of the Red Stocking Book for Women's, women's Liberation and National Healthcare, Confronting the Myth of America. She is the author of Birth Strike, and we have a stack of these. I highly recommend this book, Birth Strike, The Hidden Fight Over Women's Work, and Without Apology, The abor Abortion Struggle Now. We are so happy to have them. Big welcome for them, please. Thanks everyone, I'm, I'm honored to be uh, Sylvia's warm-up act here, so let's see how this goes. Um, so as you just heard, I um, worked with a group called National Women's Liberation from 2003 to 2013 on a campaign to make the morning after pill, after sex contraception, available without a prescription in the United States. Um, Dozens of other countries already had this when we started, um, but when, thanks to all of our campaigning and our lawsuit, the Food and Drug Administration finally recommended making the morning after pill over the counter for all ages in the US, the administration of newly elected President Barack Obama overruled it. He said he didn't want his young daughters to be able to buy this pill. Well, we were surprised that the Obama administration joined the attack on the morning after pill. Um, although he had, we had grumbled about the Democratic Party, uh, it still seemed to largely support reproductive rights. And here we were talking about a contraceptive. Um, so when we started the campaign, I was working for Red Stockings Women's Liberation Archives, and we launched a project to examine why it was that opposition to birth control was becoming mainstream. And I should say, it's usually better to go from the general to the particular, but in this case, I think I'm gonna be going from the particular and then Sylvia is gonna be giving us the general picture. So um, maybe just keep that in mind. Um, we looked at the history of birth control strictures in the United States, the dropping US birth rate and establishment reactions to it, and the situation in other countries. And we looked at our own experience having and raising children or deciding not to. And I'll just give a taste of what we found. Um, so for decades, as you all have probably heard, we've been told that abortion is just a wedge issue used by Republicans to split working class Catholics away from the Democratic Party um, and to excite a Protestant evangelical base. 
Feminist law professor Joan C. Williams explained recently, quote, starting in the 1970s, Republicans have offered support for working class anti-abortion views in exchange for working class support for pro-business positions. So according to this view, politicians and the 1% don't really care one way or the other about abortion. They're just using the issue to get votes. But when birth control was completely banned in the 19th century, in 1873, along with abortion, the chief reason given was that the birth rate had been declining. Married women were, quote unquote, avoiding the duties and responsibilities of married life, resulting in smaller families. And um, family size went on average of eight children per woman in 1800 to an average of four children per woman in 1900. Political elites feared that women were abandoning their child rearing work at home to get jobs. And they worried that Protestant native born women were using abortion to limit births while Catholics and recent immigrants were having lots of children. An Ohio Senate Select Committee convened in 1867 said, quote, shall we permit our broad and fertile prairies to be settled only by the children of aliens, unquote. If not, the committee said, native born women must be convinced not to have abortions by making the practice illegal. And that quote may sound like a tweet, you know, from a Congressman Steve King of Iowa or something, right? Um, Skip forward 150 years, the US birth rate has dropped below replacement. It's uh, considerably now below the 2.1 uh, children per woman retired for a stable population. In fact, it's at a record low of 1.72. Um, and as in, the 19, as in the 1870s, the US answer has always been immigration. But to make up for the current drop, we need something like three times the immigration we have now. Um, and immigration, at any rate, is just displacing the work and costs of having and rearing children onto other mothers and other parents and other societies, all for the benefit of employers in the United States. As corporate apologist Ben Wattenberg put it kind of gleefully, immigrants are men and women who have been raised and educated on someone else's nickel. Well, when we compare our situation to Europe, where the birth rate is low or lower than the United States, we found that um, there it is openly discussed as a problem by politicians and in newspapers. And efforts to raise the birth rate have mostly focused on making it easier to have children by fully funding childcare, providing long paid parental leave. In some places like Turkey and Poland, leaders attack reproductive rights with the open goal of raising the birth rate. And in others like France and Sweden where there are stronger feminist movements, governments promote policies that support parenting, and they've experienced higher birth rates as a result. And then some countries like Russia are doing both, increasing maternity leave and monthly government payments to parents while gnawing away at access to abortion and contraception. But in all cases, the reason for the policy is out in the open. How can we get women to make more babies? And that question has led some to a, uh, an answer that kind of echoes liberal feminists, which is equality at work. Stefan Kronert, a Berlin demographer, explained, for a long time, politicians said the high participation of women in the labor market is responsible for the low birth rate because when women go into the labor market, they don't have children anymore. But interestingly, when you look at Western European countries, the fertility rate is higher in countries with higher labor market participation of women. And then referring to the difficult conditions for German parents with school days that end at noon and little uh, provision for childcare, he says, women who decide they want a modern life with financial independence and their own professional career are very often citing, deciding to have no children at all. The lack of childcare makes women dependent on their husbands, and most women don't like this. In an article called Breaking the Baby Strike, the economist explained the falling birth rate in Turkey. Ask Turkish women about work and motherhood, and the response is a torrent of grievances. Husbands do little housework, employers are unsympathetic. In short, mothers are generally still expected to stay home, and until that changes, Turkish women will perceive a sharp choice between work and parenthood, and often go for the first. And then US journalist Stephanie Metzimer puts it a little more bluntly, quote, conservatives thought if they only made it harder for mothers to work, women would stay home. Instead, women stopped having kids. Well, in our group, a falling birth rate made perfect sense to us. Um, many of us are in our 30s, we could clearly see how the difficult conditions we face were causing us to decide to have fewer children. In a consciousness raising meeting in 2015, as we went around the room, we discovered that several of us had stopped at one child because we found it just too difficult. 
the cost, the exhaustion, the double day of working for eight or more hours, and then coming home and doing eight hours or more of care work and cooking and housework. Um, those of us who had male spouses were already doing more at home than they were, and the work of rearing one child was already as much as we could handle, and in some cases, more than we could handle. Um, some of us who didn't have kids testified that we wanted them, but it just didn't seem feasible, giving, given our unreliable health insurance, jobs that didn't provide leave, or from watching our mothers struggle, we believed that it would put us in a sexist trap that would squeeze the rest of our lives. We found our spouses were hesitant too, given their work lives or economic circumstances, and 16 of these testimonies are in the book. Um, so we believe that all over the country there are women like us who are blaming themselves when they want kids and they don't see how they can make it work. They're thinking, oh, if I'd gone into a better paying profession, if I could find a job with real paid leave, if I were brave enough to quit my job and move back where my parents live, maybe they could help with childcare. Um, if I could just find the right childcare arrangement, if I only had a spouse who worked fewer hours, if I hadn't gone into so much debt for school, in other words, we see it as something that we individually did wrong, rather than understanding that this is a system that requires our unpaid work to function. Well, establishment think tanks are now loudly fretting about the lowered birth rate. They worry about flagging consumer demand, immigration, and what they see as its attendant political problems, um, an aging workforce causing rises in entitlement spending, basically Social Security and Medicare, and how to keep the U.S. military strong when both the working age tax base and the supply of young people to enlist are shrinking. So given these anxieties, the emphasis on the family, as in the ultra-conservative group, focus on the family, makes perfect sense if by family they mean women and women's unpaid labor. Uh, Ross Douthat, the New York Times columnist, explained why large families are required. They make it easier to cut government programs. He says, one of the things we've seen over the last 30 years is that in the absence of government programs, people aren't able to function usually as atomized individuals. You need some intermediary institutions if you're gonna have a small government. So you need strong families, you need people who are willing to have large families, for instance, which can then help provide for them in their old age. So if Republicans are serious about reforming Social Security or finding a way to increase the number of young workers paying into the program, then having a country with higher population growth Larger families is an obvious and conservative way to do it. The end of the Ross Douthat douchebag quote. Um, so what we call we call their program uh, small government, big families. This is basically the program that we're facing. Um, so there was a moment when the union movement was strong after World War II, when U.S. employers put in some resources towards the care and child rearing job. Um, for a time, people expected the wages of one full-time male breadwinner, it was always male, to pay his expenses and those of his spouse, and that was called the family wage. But starting in the 70s, as wages stagnated and costs rose, households kept up by sending both spouses out to work, meaning that each couple is now generating 80 or more hours a, a week of work for employers, where it used to be 40. The job that the non-wage earning spouse used to do child rearing, housework, and caring for sick or frail family members is no longer included in one worker's paycheck to the extent it ever was, right? I mean, because a lot of people weren't getting a family wage. But it's squeezed now into the few hours left in the day after paid work. Well, the family wage was horribly sexist because it locked in discriminatory pay. It was the reason given for paying men more and paying women less. It made women dependent on male breadwinners but it did have one progressive aspect, which was that the employer was contributing resources towards the family care job. Well, obviously we don't want to go back to a sexist system of the family wage, which makes women reliant upon men for survival. So we argue the feminist way to arrange a care economy is to go forward to an increased social wage, a term used in Europe to describe services and benefits everyone in the society receives as a right. The most obvious is health care, right? Um, systems where everyone's guaranteed full coverage no matter what. But also universal child care, you know, with a unionized workforce, um, free life in public schools, paid family leave for both parents, paid sick leave mandated by law, and how about shorter work hours? Because this really is about a fight over our time. In Germany, they have 
10 extra weeks off if, if our work hours had kept up with our, our uh, productivity increases, we would, be, we would be working 20 hours a week at, at the most. Um, so to conclude, as long as we think of the battle over abortion and birth control as primarily a cultural conflict in which the two sides simply hold different worldviews, and you know, the elite is kind of a, a neutral arbiter, um, it's not really clear why corporate owners and the establishment planners would have much interest one way or the other. Um, but if we look at it as a battle over the production of humans, how many, how fast, and at what cost, then it seems likely that employers as a class would have an intense interest and they would especially care when they're pulled, called upon to put in resources as they are whenever we demand paid family leave or childcare um, or even just funding of the schools. So a reversal of our declining birth rate does serve an economic goal an ever-expanding workforce raised with a minimum of public spending and a maximum of women's unpaid work. Why would employers pay for parental leave if they can get away with not providing it? Why would corporations pay taxes for a national childcare system if families can be induced to take that burden upon themselves? Um, but women and all parents are refusing, um, and our lowest ever birth rate is demonstrating that. Um, and that may give us some leverage uh, as the birth rate goes down, the value of our unpaid labor raising successive generations can be seen more clearly by everyone. Um, so we think it's time to bring the battle out into the open um, and raise some demands. What's a birth strike without demand? So our proposed program is first show how the economy relies on women's unpaid work with employers and the rich benefiting disproportionately but making virtually no contribution. Second, defy the expectation that women will work a double day a full day of work for pay and then eight hours more of unpaid care and housework in the home. And third, use the new consciousness of the value of our work and leverage of our spontaneous birth strike to win our immediate demands for guaranteed health care, paid leave, lots of it for both parents, child care, free like the public schools, and shorter work hours for all. around a sign-in sheet if you're interested in more information about National Women's Liberation, which is a dues-funded feminist group. And also, if you're a woman of color, we have a woman of color caucus that you might be interested. Just check off in the box. Thanks. Hi, good evening, and thank you, thank you, Jenny, for this great presentation, and thank you to Moss for hosting us here. Uh, I want to add some things to what Jenny said, first of all, about the book. You should definitely buy Birth Strike. It's a very, very, very important book, not only because of what you already heard, but I think it's a book that is important because, in a way, it looks almost each chapter looks at the question of procreation, you know, birth given and so forth, uh, in terms of uh, what are its consequences and its politics and its impact on different aspects of the economy. And not only the economy, I mean, of the whole structure of capitalist accumulation. So that uh, whereas some section that we look at in terms of jobs, uh, others will look at the military, and it's a very, very interesting, I think uh, it's uh, beautiful what you do because you take <laughs> the issue of birth, birth and delivering procreation and go around the world, the capitalist world, and show that in fact that issue is really central. Mm -hmm. It's central to everything. And I think this is particularly important at a time when uh, you know, so much emphasis is placed on the fact that we are living in a capitalist, in a phase of capitalist development that doesn't <coughs> need human labor any longer, that doesn't need human beings, that we are you know, marching towards a world where the machine are doing all the work and we are going to be useless and we be replaceable 
And I think uh, that the kind of argument and the kind of analysis that you present show, in fact, you know, the, the fallacy of that, that in fact the capitalist class still needs an enormous amount of work and that in fact the, f the fact that you have a escalation of a technological development at one pole of the economy uh, requires in fact you know, an extension and the number of workers who are doing manual work and all kinds of uh, you know, uh, work at the other spectrum. And as my uh, friend George Cafensis has put it, in fact, the economy that is built on computer, you know, requires at the other side of the pole more and more slave workers. Because in the end, it's really human beings who produce wealth for capitalism. It's not the machine who are producing wealth. It's really human beings, it's human labor who are really uh, creates uh, the wealth that the capitalist society accumulates. And so it is very really important to not lose sight of that aspect. Secondly, uh, it is also important to see that when we speak of procreation, when we speak of everything that relates to birth control, we also have to speak in the same breath right, of the material condition of our life and we have to speak about the structural organization of society, the economy, politics and so forth. And uh, this is again very important and in fact it connects with the title of my last book which is called Beyond the Periphery of the Skin beyond the periphery of the skin. I wanted to, it's a book about the body, the continuous certain themes that I developed in Caliban and the Witch, particularly the theme of the mechanization of the body in capitalism, the fact that capitalism turns our bodies into work machines, mm -hmm. not all the same work machines, and uh, there's a particular type of mechanization that comes with wage labor, other uh, type of mechanization that comes, for example, with the labor of reproduction, but certainly there is a process of mechanization. And, uh, but what I wanted to express and communicate through the title and the essays in the book is that we cannot transform our life simply by acting on our body and being concerned with what happens to our body, as important and crucial as that is. Basically as a sort of rebuke to some tendencies of the women's movement of the 1970s who concentrated you know, their, their activism, mobilization on the question of abortion and uh, often identifying abortion, the right to abort, as a choice. And as we know already, this has been the origin of a whole critique, particularly by black women and the movement for reproductive justice that developed in the 80s and 90s to this day, right? who saw that in fact, uh, you don't have choice. Abortion represents only one aspect of choice. What about the right to have children and to have children without sacrificing our life? And what about the history of the many women, like black women in this country, the women under slavery, who have been systematically denied the right to have children, the right to maternity? And so the importance of uh, seeing that if we want, for example, to control our lives, to control our procreation, to control our body, you know, we also have to change the world around us. We have to change the material condition of our life. And this, in fact, is the theme that connects 
all the articles in, uh, in this book that I just uh, published with PM Press. You know, the fact that uh, we cannot simply think of uh, transforming our life unless we also change its material conditions. And I want to come back to this point, uh, uh, you know, in a minute. But I also wanted to add, you know, something about uh, the discussion of, um, you know, procreation and the politics of birth control. Because whereas it is true, and I completely agree with you, the capitalism is still dependent on, on procreation and living labor and human labor, and therefore is vitally interested. It's vitally interested in uh, the number of children who are produced. And in many, many countries, in many, many ways, you know, they are incentivizing natality. It is also true, it is also true that uh, they are very concerned as to who is allowed to reproduce and who is not allowed. And that at the same time, for instance, in the course of the last decades, at the same time that in many cases they have criminalized contraception and certainly criminalized abortion or made it more and more and more difficult, as in the US, introducing more and more restriction. Nevertheless, at the same time, they have also sponsored programs, international programs, that uh, have in fact, uh, you know, uh, made it impossible for many women to have children. And probably, you know, you will remember that uh, by the 19, early 1980s, you know, the top echelon scientists, demographers, politicians, particularly in the United States, all were screaming about the problem of population explosion. Remember the population explosion. Interested enough, <laughs> their own control, their own <laughs> concern uh, with the number of people who were being born <coughs> across the world, and this alarm about the fact that the world population was reproducing way beyond, you know, its resources, <coughs> all came, you know, on the wake of a long struggle, particularly in the former colonial world, an anti-colonial struggle. And it's quite <coughs> interesting, and I don't think accidental, that at the very moment, at the very moment when you have many countries going through a process of decolonization, and even more so, you have a new generation, for instance, of African, of people from Latin America, or the Caribbean island, you know, who are growing up and are beginning to mobilize, to demand back the wealth that has been taken away from their country, the wealth that generation and generation of colonialists have taken away from their country, <coughs> the moment they began to reclaim their wealth, immediately, you know, the echelons, top echelons of international capital discover that we are too many. <laughs> discover that we are too many and that we have, in fact, to begin to reduce the number of those who are born. And whereas the same people would incentivize birth in white communities in Europe or in the United States. <coughs> they would set up, for example, sterilization safaris in Indonesia, in India, in Africa, you know, push Depo Provera, push North Plan, push IOD, push forms of birth control that in fact People will not be able, women will not be able to control. The ones implanted, you could not take away unless with access to a doctor. And, um, and many times the reforms, the ways in which this was implemented was quite horrible. For instance, we know now in many countries, they would wait, they would hire armies 
of uh, social workers, they will go to the villages, you know, to spread this form of contraception mm. or to cut women's tubes and uh, in many cases in exchange for some food or for some gadget. And so, so I think it's very important that there is a politics that works uh, from the point of view of um, establishing that they, the government, the politician, the capitalist, have the right to decide mm -hmm. who is allowed to reproduce and who is not allowed to reproduce. Mm -hmm. And whereas in some places they would incentivize birth and make it as difficult as possible for women to have children, to have abortion, at the opposite end of the spectrum, they would also make it impossible for women to have children. And then we have phenomena like the one I want to speak about now have not developed on it so much in, uh, you know, beyond the periphery of the skin, but somehow I talked about, which is, the phenomenon that is being defined by some national health advocate here in the United States as decriminalization of pregnancy. Criminalization of pregnancy, particularly of women who have low resources and particularly black women, immigrant women. And what do we mean by criminalization of pregnancy? I can refer you, if you want to do, learn more than I can present tonight, to the reports that uh, women like Lynn Paltrow, who is a national health advocate in New York, who for many, many years has been working on these themes. And what she has discovered is that, uh, when, as she put it, if you are a black woman and you're poor, you don't have much money, et cetera, et cetera, you decide to have a child, you decide to become pregnant, Practically, you place yourself outside of the boundary of the Constitution. This is what she has said, and not my word. You place yourself outside of the boundary of the Constitution because you become immediately vulnerable to all kinds of accusation, charges, implying jail sentences that you know, nobody else, you know, could be uh, made vulnerable to. For example, already, you know, black women and proletarian women who were in car accidents and uh, they told the police that they were pregnant. They were arrested for putting the, re the at risk the fetus. Uh, others, have been arrested for taking medicaments that again could affect you know, the gestation process. Mm -hmm. Others have been arrested for refusing to have a cesarean cut. Already hundreds of women have gone through penalties and through jail terms uh, for interfering, interfering with the health of the fetus. Now all of this Right, is being uh, promoted and justified on the basis of the defense of life, right? The worth of life isn't life sacred after all. But what is very interesting is that in the very moment the fetus is born, that interest in the life is gone. Then it's an uphill battle to gain the minimal resources to raise children. So that we cannot <coughs> honestly accept that all these recommendations about, as you probably know now in several states, fetuses have rights. They have personhood rights, right? So in fact, what is happening now more and more is that the rights of the fetuses are going up and up, and the rights of women are going down and down. And women are seen more and more, you know, talking about the mechanization of the body, talking about capitalism turning the body of people into work machine. Well, 
The bodies of women are turned into machines for the production of workers, mm -hmm. right? But in this case, the mechanization is working in another way. But so it's impossible to accept that there is a concern for life because the very moment that the fetus is born, you know, uh, all forms of welfare assistance and support, you know, are completely erased. Mm -hmm. you know? But I think it is very important because as we are now entering into a new battle, <coughs> right, new restrictions are now being passed on abortion right and left. Mm -hmm. You know, I was reading the other day an article in the New York Times, some of you may have seen it, you know, which says that the big debate now in the right, that the right is very split on this issue because there is one part of the right who basically wants to do away, you know, with abortion by incremental restriction. You keep adding up restriction, 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 and soon there will be no abortion. And the other part of the right is saying, forget it. You know, let's just quickly to the point. Let's just abolish it. Let's go to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court now, you know, will have the numbers to, to abolish Roe and Wade. So it's very clear that we're going to have towards new mobilization. We're going to have new struggles around this issue and probably a new strong movement, hopefully. But at the same time, I hope that that struggle will not be limited only to defending the right for abortion. That that struggle at the same time, at all point, in all way, will also be a struggle to ensure that women who want to have children can have children and don't have to pay for those children with their lives and do not have to face the level of criminalization of difficulties that they are facing today. And, uh, and this is where the question of continuously at all point, you know, joining, and, and that's what the, you know, birth strike, why birth strike is so important. The struggle to, for <coughs> ourselves to be able to control our body it has to be at all time mm -hmm. added, amplified, and connected with the struggle to earn, to gain, to reappropriate the material resources that make it possible to have children and again to provide, to bring them into the world, you know, where their experience of life is not an experience of misery. Thank you very much. Thanks for the great talk uh, to both of the authors. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering if there, uh, if uh, what you have said, these, the deterioration of the material conditions has something to do with the escalation of violence, physical violence, uh, specifically against women. Because to me, it sounds a little bit paradoxical, even from a brutal capitalist standpoint. I mean, if you have a machine, as you said, that produces workers, you don't want to break the machine. Yet we see that it it escalates further and further. So if mm -hmm. you could speak a little bit more about that, I would appreciate that. I mean, Thank you very much. Can come with that. Danny <laughs> yeah. Then, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can we get several and then? And oh, yeah. Okay. Good yeah. idea. Yeah. 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 Uh, there's one yeah. behind here. Come up behind. Yeah. <laughs> oh, come on. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, oh, 
to you. Um, Thank you so much. Um, I think uh, both of you make this really incredible connection between um, reproductive justice and the fight for what I would call <coughs> democratic socialism or an anti-capitalist um, society that puts people mm -hmm. over profits. And I'm wondering what you think the, the role of labor and organized strikes should be in the fight for reproductive justice. Yeah. You want to get one or two more? Let's get at least two mm -hmm. more. Yeah. Yeah. Can you get it? Yes. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. I'll move it. <laughs> yeah, move it. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, right. Um. Uh, uh, it was mentioned the case also of involuntary sterilization, mm. and uh, also was mentioned in the third word, etc. Third word meaning also within. Yankee imperialist American jurisdiction, like in the in the nation of Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. that in the fifties were involuntary programs of sterilization of uh, Puerto Rican women. Curiously, at the same time, it was uh, implemented this uh, massive uh, uh, so first uh, uh, sweatshops in the world by uh, you know Operation Bootstrap, mm -hmm. and at the same time, it was mm -hmm. around the Korean War where the United States built this uh, brigade of Puerto Rican men called mm -hmm. the 65th Infantry Regiment, which was the last segregated United States Army mm -hmm. unit. And that, you know, all these men that came sick, wounded, whatever, also were burdened to uh, uh, families, etc. cetera. So uh, this was done on the American so-called mm -hmm. flag in the so-called US territory. So I just want to mention that as yeah, an example. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, and Thank then you. when Thank we you give it much. to her. Looking through history, it seems that women have led a lot of revolutions and social movements coming from the French Revolution, the March on Versailles, the Russian Revolution, the bread strikes. Right now, what I see in the women's movement almost seems non-existent, like how can we get all these different waves and different groups and identity groups within the women's movement to work together to build a coalition that is based on feminist ideals. Okay. Tackle one, some two, of these. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Class here with a hand in yeah. that one. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the violence against women breaking the machine from a capitalist perspective, I mean, Violence is always a, a means of social control, right? So you don't have to be violent to everybody. You just have to be violent to enough people to scare everybody else. And that is, I mean, if you work in, um, you know, talking to people who have experienced domestic violence, it's very much about controlling you. It's not necessarily about destroying you. It's about controlling your actions and, and movements. So I think that might be one part of the answer. Um, on the role of labor in organizing for reproductive justice. I mean, a lot of the demands that we're making are really reproductive justice demands when we are, <coughs> when we do, and you have seen this in the teacher strikes, right? A lot of them are basically around how are we gonna raise kids? Where are the resources gonna come from? Are we gonna have nurses in the school? Or are we gonna have sick kids that don't have access to nurses? Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. So I think it already kind of is a lot of, you know, and the demand for national health care, which has been a labor demand. I was involved in the effort to start a labor party in the United States in the 90s, and that was one of our big things. Just health care was a big demand. Um, so I think it's, there's already a mix, but I am somewhat skeptical that we will be able to, for example, get people to do political strikes to object to, say, a anti-abortion decision from the Supreme Court, which some people in DSA are talking about, how can we get unions kind of on board on this? Because it is a situation where you will, uh, there will be a minority of the union who are anti-abortion and they it basically are splitting your membership around something that uh, is not directly a boss fight. So, mm -hmm. so that's gonna be very difficult. But I think, I was just talking to somebody here earlier um, about this, 
I think that within the demand for Medicare for all, with full reproductive rights, we do have a chance to make coalitions and mobilizations around that that are led by unions. So I would say that. Um, thank the brother for get, telling the long sorted history of this, the, the sterilization in Puerto Rico. And one, one thing to understand about this is it was basically a land grab. Like US sugar companies took over 80% of the farmable land. And as Celia pointed out, oh, suddenly they're worried about overpopulation, right? It's only overpopulation when we start to revolt. Um, and uh, I think that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, I, yeah, I want continuing with that also, right? We have seen the history of sterilization. I mean, the issue of uh, struggling around the material condition of life and reproduction is because particularly in this country, you know, the history of making it impossible for a whole sector of women from slavery to the present and uh, making it impossible to have access to if they decide to be mothers. Mm -hmm. Think of the 70s, for example, how many women were sterilized when they were on welfare. Mm -hmm. Did they go to the hospital to deliver and just out of anesthesia, they would be given a piece of paper many times you know, in English, often they were immigrant, etc., and they'll be told that if they didn't sign it, you know, their welfare check would be cut, etc. It's a whole, whole history that I think is extremely important, never to forget. And it's that history, in fact, which has led to the movement for reproductive justice. Reproductive justice means you cannot ignore the condition, you know, that enable also women to have children. And the question, the question of labor, I, I think, I mean, I look forward to a really big transformation of what we call labor, right? Of workers' organization, etc. Because, you know, uh, there was a time, for instance, that, uh, you know, working class organization not only, were not only concerned with negotiating the conditions of work in the workplace narrowly defined, but they were concerned with the whole life of the worker, right? Until the 1930s, for example, there were many workers' organizations that dealt with issues like pension, dealt with issues like health, and in that, they had a profound roots in the community. So they, for example, if there was a strike or there was a labor issue, the whole community was really involved in it. And in a way, the New Deal, which is always celebrated as, you know, uh, giving more power to worker, in the end, you know, institutionalized, institutionalized labor relations. And so that you have the ritual negotiation for the country, but you also have a narrowing. You have a narrowing of what is being negotiated, and there's so much part of the life of a worker that falls out of the of the concern of the labor union. So I think that we have to really think also of a transformation of a concept of working class organization. And the issue of unity, I think you're touching, you know, the one of the most important issues in any struggle, in any process of social change, because I'm profoundly convinced that what gives power to the capitalist class <coughs> is not just the amount of bombs that they have, but is really the kind of division they have been able to plant among people. Mm -hmm. So that many times they don't even have to, you know, discipline ourselves directly. They can do that, you know, by having one sector of workers discipline other worker has it been the case for instance with uh, you know male workers in the case of women and so I think uh, this issue of unity you know I am programmatically optimistic and I want to believe <laughs> that the severity of the crisis that we are meet that we are facing today we put sense in people's mind and uh, convince to go beyond, you know, many of the issues that are now divi dividing the women's movement and other movements, 
and, uh, and begin to see, start from what is uniting us, mm -hmm. seeing what we have in common, <coughs> and to see that unless, unless we build, we go beyond those uh, differences and so forth, we are going to face very, very, very wretched condition of living. And we already see now, one of the themes I develop in this book is the crisis of reproduction that we are facing in so many ways, children, the elderly, healthcare, all reflected in what's happening to the body, the rising number of suicides, of course, all the big epidemic of the opioid. There's a tremendous crisis that is really a sign, a very clear sign of uh, you know, the brutality you know, of the system in which we are living and uh, the la collapse you know, of the life expectancy, for instance. You know, everybody has been celebrating for years the fact that now people are living until 80. Well, maybe a minority, but in fact, overall, life expectancy is declining and the conditions of living are such that, for example, in the case of women, you know, we have an immense increase in the number of women who are depressed. Women are the main consumer of antidepressant mm -hmm. in the country. Every year they consume millions and millions of pills, which enables to go from one day to the next because life is so wretched. You know, work, 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 deaths, always worrying if you're going to make it, facing the possibility of losing your home, no security for the future, constant anxiety, no wonder then people are depressed. You know, so you have the situation of women who are selling their, renting their uterus, right? The great increase in uh, number of women in this country right, who are working as surrogate mother to gain access to some money, you know, and perhaps, you know, pay for a mortgage, perhaps, uh, you know, have some economic security. So that you have all, it turns out the United States is now a country where people come if they want to find a surrogate mother. And I think that tells us volume. So I think it's very, very important that, uh, you know, we set aside, you know, there are obviously differences that are not reconcilable. <laughs> But um, unfortunately, many times, particularly these days, we see a lot of divisions <coughs> that are not in a way touching on issues of fundamental, but touching on issues of identities and so forth that uh, should be able to be you know, overcome if we look at them from the point of view of the broader situation, the broader context of the transformation mm -hmm. of the basic condition of our existence, the basic condition of our reproduction. And I have to say that, uh, for example, in places like uh, Latin America, in Chile, in Argentina, Uruguay, this is now happening. Mm -hmm. you know, the spaces are being created where women coming from different sectors, and I don't mean bourgeois women, with, but I'm talking about women who are working in the union, women that are working in solidarity economy, uh, fighting against transgenic, et cetera, et cetera. They're really creating a common ground, and I think this is the way to go. More question? Yes. Um, so, thank you so much, <laughs> both of you. One of the um, aspects of your, um, of the sort of um, work that I enjoy very much is the, the explanation of patriarchy not simply allied to capitalism, but that ca patriarchy has been constituted through capitalism as well, right? Mm -hmm. So, not just as capitalism um, represses women, but how it 
builds this idea of woman as we know it nowadays because it has its function mm -hmm. to think capitalist uh, economy. So I was wondering uh, how you do this reading in terms of race. Mm -hmm. Because one thing is to say that, for example, uh, the, the hysteria around the birth womb is has been repressed as uh, a response to anti-colonial struggle. But I would like to understand how race itself and racial hierarchy is constituted through capitalism with an economic purpose and mm -hmm. how this connects with the kind of um, birth control or like racialized birth control that you're mm -hmm. talking about. Thanks. You want to know how this is constituted in this yes. case? <laughs> <laughs> okay, how many days we have? <laughs> No, but yeah. so. no, no, I mean, I think the whole history of the last five centuries, I mean, it's a whole history. I think that what is more uh, methodologically, right, obviously capitalism as whole created uh, racial discrimination has been a fundamental, fundamental structural element mm -hmm. of capitalist development, you know, at all point because they would not have been able to impose certain forms, most brutal, intense form of exploitation you know, without covering up. And they would not have been able to present this uh, democratic face to the world. Capitalism you know, as a uh, you know, democratic system. Eh? Democratic, so democratic, how do you explain slavery if you are so democratic? How do you explain colonialism? Right, so there is always this racial justification given. Well, it's because these poor people they cannot really uh, aspire or <coughs> produce, etc., etc. I think that what is more important is to see how the construction, you know, of racism also continuously transform, mm. because uh, at every phase of development or in response to struggles. Uh, also, the way the racialization of people is restructured, find new argument, find new ways. Same thing with sexism, right? It's not always the same patriarchal ideologies in the history of capitalism, it's not always the same. Although it might have the same end, the same finality, right? But it's continuously reconstituted given new foundation and so forth. And that I think is very important because the forms of racism that are used, for example, uh, today are not necessarily against the women, slave women in the plantation, right? They were op often represented as witches, you know, because of the African ritual, because uh, of uh, the role that they had in the protest, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, or through the last uh, decades, for instance, uh, even though it's true that also as a heritage of slavery, there's always been this uh, attempt to show that black women are unfit for motherhood, right? Uh, that, uh, you know, for instance, in the 70s, the whole attack on women on welfare Right? And then following upon that attack, you know, the whole portrayal of black women as uh, producing crack babies, right? which was producing dysfunctional societies, which was used over and over and over to justify, for example, this carceral mass incarceration of black youth. There's a very powerful book that you should definitely read by Dorothy Roberts, Killing the Black Body. Killing the Black Body is a must read. It's a very important book because it really goes through all the history, right, of the, basically, the attack, the war that uh, capitalist society, in particular in the United States, has waged on black women, including the question of maternity. And uh, you know, through slavery, through the attack on the welfare movement, the welfare rights movement, through the drug epidemics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> and I think it's very important to see, and uh, particularly, you know, in terms of politics of 
the body politics, the body politics that we need today, you know, for the new phase of the feminist movement. I had just a sh short comment on that. In, in Birth Strike, I go through kind of the phases of the US elite and the slaveholders' um, ideas around population. And one of the, what you see is during slavery, right, as soon as importation of enslaved people is made illegal, um, then the reproduction of enslaved women is the only way that uh, slave owners can reproduce their systems. So this means that they, I mean, they basically invent gynecology just to increase production of, of by enslaved women of, of babies. Of course, there's a lot of resistance and um, apparently chewing cotton root is a particularly good contraceptive. Um, a lot of the attacks on, uh, you know, as, as Sylvia was pointing out, like you would, midwives um, would uh, help with abortions and help with even infanticide. Um, in Jamaica, uh, enslaved women would be allowed to go out of the fields if they had a live baby, but they still refused. That's the kind of um, that's the kind of resistance that that the slave system experienced. But then after slavery ends, they have this problem of keeping the black labor force in place, and so you see as the Great Migration starts to um, gain momentum and, and people are leaving the South to, to get out from under the oppression there, um, they go on to trains, tear up everybody's tickets, arrest people, keep trains from stopping places. I mean, they really want to keep labor in place. So what happens in the 60s when we start to see forced sterilization is that the cotton uh, crop has been mechanized specifically for the political purpose of uh, putting down uh, the, w the incipient civil rights movement, which we see as early as the 40s, um, especially black veterans coming home, demanding uh, a little more democracy. They're armed, they're trained. Um, this scares the white landowners, and they quickly try to mechanize. First, they have a labor shortage during the war, but they quickly try to mechanize. And so then you start to see this effort to reduce, again, suddenly there are, people are over populous because, the, because capitalism doesn't need them. And then you see the bringing in sterilization. So there are these waves based on what, uh, what is needed. And so right now, what are we seeing? Well, we're seeing the Texas legislature is having to gerrymander the hell out of their state because it's a majority of people of color state at this point. Um, they're scared of being like California where, you know, I mean, it's not a paradise, but we did get like higher wages and we have a strong union movement and whatnot and Texas does not want that, you know, environmental regulations, they don't want that. So this is why we're seeing a lot of the anti-immigrant uh, stuff coming through. So anyway, watch all of the ups and downs and how it, how it tracks with what um, capitalists need and you'll, you'll see a lot of interesting stuff. I want to add something about yeah, this, yeah, yeah. Uh, about slavery. You know, you probably know it, but uh, just to remind ourselves about the perversity of this system, you probably know that Virginia, in Virginia, a whole breeding industry was developed. And breeding industry in the sense that you know, black women, slaved women were mm. systematically raped to force them to produce slaves. And uh, Jefferson, Jefferson basically promoted this. And uh, when he spoke against the import of slaves from Africa, did so not for humanitarian concern, but rather to protect the breeding industry of Virginia. And so you have this uh, actually back and forth between Virginia and places like Alabama or Georgia that continues to import slaves from Africa. This, I think, gives us a measure right, of uh, the uh, barbarity of the system that uh, you know, women, they would actually have you know, men, often black men, enslaved men, who would be moved from 
plantation to plantation in charge of actually inseminating women, so the violence of that. And Jefferson said, you know, uh, women are much more productive than men, you know, because a man, you know, through his days of work can produce a certain amount of crops, but a woman can produce many workers, and therefore there's a multiplication, right? She multiplies, you know, the, the production. So uh, that I think is very uh, telling. So there was someone over here who wanted to ask? Oh, okay. Thank you both very much. I, I just have a, a question to put to you. Do either of you, <coughs> it's about the human humanist horizon. Um, would either of you comment on my feeling that there's a necessity to connect the sterilization campaigns with the, uh, the sterilization, uh, the laboratory centered pioneers here at Berkeley uh, attempting to sterilize other life forms, the, the terminated gene and so on. I take them to be an attempt to uh, enclose the germplasm of the world, which of course differentially uh, impacts the women of the world. It's a question about other life forms apart from just uh, right. yeah, the sterilization generally. Maybe you can elaborate yeah. so that we... Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I'm not enough familiar with, you know, perhaps I need a little bit more prop because I'm not <laughs> immediately, I don't know uh, the sterilization of other life form. Uh, what uh, that encompasses. Right, okay. what, yeah, what, maybe. One more, yeah? one more sentence. Uh, sure. So, <coughs> um, the seed is is the gift mm -hmm. to the farmer. It is a Janus-based okay. object. The first it faces, of right, course. it's the means of production and right. as, well, as well as the product, which ground gives us the bread of life. Mm -hmm. The sterilization of the germplasm okay. is, a, is a very serious business. Okay, yeah. yeah okay. You surely sure, got something sure. there. <laughs> right, right. Okay, so in that sense, sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, this is this yeah. is the privatization of the of the commons, right? I yeah. mean, the, the, our 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 world, our our nature, and and taking it for private use. That's the. Yeah, I think I think there are yeah. great there are absolutely connections. It's the same thing. Yeah, and also these seeds, I mean, the production of Monsanto, the production of seeds that do not reproduce. You know, this is incredible. I mean, so people have to buy them every year, right? And uh, literally, you become a criminal if you save seeds, if you share seeds. But now it's happening, you know, in many places. And it's often women. I know in Latin America and the Caribbean, it's women who do seed banks. Mm -hmm. And they do these seed banks because Otherwise, you have to buy it every time. So you have sterile seeds, you know, which is really very indicative again. You know, seeds are the seeds of life, right? They're food, they produce life. And instead, they're dead, they're sterile. <laughs> yeah, that's what you have. Huh? So <laughs> definitely, there's a continuity. Mm. You know? And the whole principle is that you have to pay every time. You have to buy them every time. You know? Uh, thank you uh, both so much for these comments and uh, for the books that you've written. Um, I'm thinking a lot about this question of black maternity and um, what we see happening with um, maternal health outcomes and infant mortality with black women today. Yeah. And it feels to me like there's a definition of racism um, that terms it mm -hmm. as differential exposure to death. Mm. And it feels like we're moving into a place where we're seeing racism enacted as a as a differential access to life, mm. um, you know, in a lot of different ways. It's not just with black women, but I think mm -hmm. there's something really uh, there's a huge question for me around the you know the fact of the the research that shows that that black women who have more education, more wealth 
uh, have worse outcomes with, with maternal mortality, infant mortality. Mm. Uh, it, it's, uh, it seems like a, a frightening uh, type of progress um, mm. in terms of the racial capitalist program that we're subjected to. And I wonder if um, either or both of you could speak a little bit about how you see that progression, what, like where we're, uh, where we're going or why, why something like that would be happening, that it's not just based on um, class oppression or uh, less resources, it's something else is going. Mm. I don't know if that's a cl clear question, but. Yeah, no, I think it's very clear. I mean, it's true that, but uh, I think uh, s the discussion that is taking place, right, the fact, for instance, the infant mortality now among black women and also women are not dispossessed, poor, etc., etc. It's on average the same it used to be, you know, in the 1850s, which is a quite amazing, right? And we see also the differential treatment, for example, of women when they go to the hospital and so on. And I think there is in the discussion has emerged more and more that uh, the effects that income is crucial, but at the same time, the wear and tear and traumas of living in a society where you encounter racism, no matter what is your income, if you are a black woman, you are so, in a way, exposed to the uh, tension, to the difficulties of living in a society and so racist, that this has an impact on your health as an impact on your capacity to reproduce, and it affects the body, is not a machine. And uh, the fact of being exposed to the tension of living in this kind of society, this in fact is what you know, many people, and also the fact that when you go to a hospital, you know, racism <laughs> is in many ways indivisible, and uh, it's so difficult to get the same kind of care. I mean, the famous example of Serena Williams, you know, that you go and they don't listen to you. You tell them and they don't pay attention. And so racism affects, has effects that go beyond the immediate income. And, you know. Yeah, I just have one thing to add, which is, um, I've been touring around the country talking about the birth strike book and black women have raised their hands and said, the reason I'm not having kids is because I'm scared I'm gonna die in the hospital when I bear my yeah. child. So um, it's, it's that profound right now. Yeah. And even, you know, I mean, the tension in a woman's life, right? You, you, are, you are continuously afraid if you are a black woman to be about your relative, your, your friends, your, your family, your children, what is going to happen to them, right? And this continuous sense of tension and uncertainty, it really eats your life. And uh, so again, the question of income is crucial, but uh, you know, the attack on people's life goes beyond that. Are we one more question, one <coughs> more round. Okay, where's the, there? Yeah, just, just yell. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in a way, you said it, you know, it's also what is happening in so many parts of Latin America, you know, where there's now constant massacre in Colombia almost every week, you know, leaders in, uh, you know, peasant struggle or, or particularly women, like women like Berta Caceres and so on, you know. Uh, today, you find that these women who are basically in the forefront of many struggles to defend their community, to defend the natural environment, the waters, the forest. It's like, uh, you know, in uh, Dakota, women call themselves the water protectors. And so it's not an accident. They're really the target of so much violence. You know? 
and so <coughs> and then some part of the tree. No more? Anybody else? Um, yeah, okay, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> Thank you so much.